So good evening. Um, thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk about thin film photovoltaics. Um, and this is an area that uh, I'm currently working on here, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. It's also an area that uh, I worked on at IBM. Most people don't realize IBM actually does work on solar cells. Uh, and I managed a, a, the, thin, the photovoltaic science and uh, technology department there for six years. So I don't, in this crowd, I think I don't have to convince you that energy has been vital for our evolution since the beginning of time. A uh, few examples are early on we were dependent on biomass and animal muscle. And this enabled us to go from a um, hunting gathering society to uh, an agricultural uh, type society. And then of course in the 17 and 1800s, coal helped to enable the industrial revolution which again had a profound effect on our on our society and, and of course now we just heard a talk uh, a few talks ago on oil and, and oil basically dominates our lives at this point. And so the question is what will be the next energy revolution? And I think in terms of trying to understand where we're going, it's useful to uh, look at where we are. Uh, and these plots from the, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory are quite useful. They come out every year and they, they basically tell us where all the energy we use uh, comes from and where it goes. Uh, and I think the, the important points to take home from this particular plot from 2014 is that we currently use about 100 quads of energy, which ultimately comes out to be about 250 kilowatt hours per person per day. And so this is quite a bit of energy. Um, the other point is, is if you look over on the left, um, of course this laser pointer doesn't work on the screen, but in any case, um, you'll see that uh, most of our energy comes from carbon-based fuel sources, natural gas, coal, uh, and petroleum. And so, of course, these, these carbon-based fuels also contribute to our, our carbon that's being dumped into the environment in the form of carbon dioxide. So we emit about 5.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide and not surprisingly, this comes from our, our carbon-based fuels. And so the question is moving forward, how can we come up with technologies that are sustainable and that don't contribute to this problem? And if you look at the, the upper left-hand corner, there are a few technologies that have nice zeros in terms of, of how they're impacting our uh, carbon input into the environment. So these look kind of interesting. And uh, these, these technologies are what we'd call renewables. Renewable because they're um, replenished continuously. And they currently constitute about 10% of our energy supply. They're technologies like biomass, hydroelectricity, wind. Solar, disappointingly, um, falls fairly far down on this list and contributes less than 0.5% to our, our energy mix at this point. And so the question is, um, shouldn't we be able to do better? And so we can look at the supply of solar energy. Uh, and these again are useful plots that you could pull off the internet. They're called insulation plots. They measure how much energy falls on uh, particular areas of, of our country uh, averaged over the year. Uh, so it averages in night and day, cloudy, sunny, everything. And if we look at this plot, we see that it averages between say three kilowatt hours per meter square per day up to around eight kilowatt meters square per day. So certainly the desert southwest is the, the, the best place to be putting these solar panels. But if we assume an average of around five kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hours per meter square per day uh, and we assume 15 percent efficiency in converting sunlight into electricity, we find going through the calculations that we need about three 300 meters square per person of, sol of these solar panels in order to supply all of our energy needs. And this, if you multiply by our population, leads to around 10 to the fifth kilometers squared of, of solar panels. So that's a lot of area. Uh, but we can compare this to other, other large areas. We find that it's about 1% of our, of our U.S. land area. It's about uh, the same area as is used for all of railroads, airports, uh, roads. Uh, and it's about ten times the area that's used for, for roof, uh, suitable roof area for solar panels. 
And so I think from this we can see that uh, we can do substantially better than 0.5 percent if we can address uh, the issue of cost. Uh, we all know cost is important, and currently solar energy it, in most markets is still uh, more expensive than what we were hearing about before, namely natural gas. And if we compare these on, in the terms of levelized cost of electricity, uh, which measures the, uh, uh, the cost of electricity taking into account not just the capital cost of installing, but operation over the lifetime of the, the facility, uh, solar energy comes out to be between, say, 10 and 20 cents per kilowatt hour, whereas natural gas is around 6 cents per kilowatt hour. And so in a study done by the Department of Energy, they concluded that if we can get down to this cost point, 6 cents per kilowatt hour, solar energy should be able to constitute around 15 percent, 14 percent of our electricity supply by 2030 and 27 percent by 2050. So we're currently at 0.5 percent, going toward 20 percent, that would be a pretty, pretty big growth opportunity. So that's exciting. How do we get there? If we look at a solar cell, a solar cell is basically a, a semiconductor device. It's a giant PN junction diode. Uh, basically, if we have a photon of light coming in with an energy greater than the band gap, it can excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. And because of the electric field in the solar cell, electrons will be accelerated in one direction, holes in the other. And if you hook this up to an external circuit, it can do electrical work and, and you have a useful solar cell. Uh, most of these solar cells are based on crystalline silicon. Uh, so we have a silicon wafer that's doped P-type, uh, which forms the absorber. That's where most of the light is absorbed. And then on top of that, we have a very thin N-type uh, silicon layer to complete the PN junction. Uh, and then, of course, we have contacts on the front and the back. And th this type of solar cell constitutes 90 percent of the market. But it's relatively thick. We need around 200 or more n microns of silicon in order to be able to collect the sunlight because silicon is not very effective at, at absorbing the sun. And so there's a second class of solar cells known as thin film solar cells, which employ much more effective materials for absorbing the sun. Things like cadmium telluride or SIGs, which is copper indium gallium sulfide selenide. And in these cases, we can get by with on the order of a micron or, or maybe up to five microns of material. Uh, so it's about two orders of magnitude less material than in the silicon based devices. And so the idea behind this is that by going to thin film devices, we hopefully can save costs because we need much less material. So we can also look at, at uh, the, the market situation for thin film. Uh, as I said, thin film constitutes about 10 percent of the market. If you look at the, the plot on the left, uh, the top three bars correspond to thin film technologies and the rest various flavors of crystalline silicon. Uh, and overall, we can see that thin film is staying constant at around 10 percent of the market, um, out, it projected out through 2018. However, the mix of technologies is shifting from thin film amorphous silicon to uh, particularly SIGs, but also st uh, relatively stable for cadmium telluride. And if we look on the right, we can see despite the fact that thin film is staying at roughly fixed 10 percent of the market, the market is growing and therefore the market for thin film is growing at a fairly healthy rate, uh, back from, from around 2 gigawatts of install capacity in 2010 up to around 4.5 projected <laughs> for 2015. Uh, so we have growth in the thin film market. Most of this growth is dominated by SIGs. Uh, and the question is, are there other thin film technologies that can, yes? Um, can you give us a sense as to how efficient thin film is versus silicon? And how, I mean, because if silicon is 200 times less expensive than the thin film stuff, I mean, can you give us a sense as to how the, my engineering is not super strong, so how does that kind of translate into the price and the efficiency? Sure. So, um, in terms of efficiency, thin film is now 
almost as efficient as crystalline silicon. So crystalline silicon record device efficiencies converting photons into electrons is around 25%. Um, for thin film technologies like SIGs and cadmium telluride, the record is now around 21%. So they're doing quite well. In terms of cost, currently silicon um, is operating at maybe 70 cents per um, do dollars per watt, um, which is very good. Um, some of that may be artificial. artificial. Um, but the lowest cost technology is actually cadmium telluride, um, which is in the 60s, 60 cent range at this point. So it's very competitive. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so are there other technologies? And, and actually, I'll go back to that question about comparing them in a minute. Uh, that can shift the market share. And this is one of the areas that, that I'm currently working on is we're looking at two emerging technologies areas. One is kestorites, is known as kestorites, and I'll explain what that is. And the other are perovskites, and I'll also explain what that is. Um, so if we look at kestorites, kestorites are, are based on metal calcogenides. Calcogenides are just materials that involve carbon, that involve sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. And so two examples that are already commercialized are cadmium telluride and SIGs. Uh, both of these technologies have over, uh, over three, and in the case of cadmium telluride, over eight gigawatts of cumulative production. They both have exhibited uh, efficiencies over 21 percent. Uh, so this is very exciting. Some of the advantages are that, again, they require less material. Uh, we can use polycrystalline films instead of needing single crystal like silicon uh, because the boundaries between the crystals are not very effective at breaking up these or, or causing recombination of the photoexcited carriers. Uh, we can also use monolithic integration approaches. Those are very important in bringing down the cost of, of um, electronics. It's also very important for solar uh, technologies. Uh, and because of the thin nature of the technology, uh, the fabrication approaches are compatible with flexible substrates. And this is important because it means rather than having to do individual batches, we can maybe set up a roll of substrate and just have it going continuously. And so all of these things can reduce cost. Um, unfortunately, there are some issues. Cadmium telluride involves cadmium, which is a heavy metal. And both of these technologies involve elements that are rare in the Earth's crust. When you think about going to terawatts of power, this is an issue because you, you may not have enough elements to, to scale. Uh, and so for this reason, there's interest in this other technology known as CZTS, copper zinc tin sulfide selenide, in which we're replacing the indium from SIGs with much lower cost and more plentiful zinc and tin. Uh, and because we're replacing indium with two elements, zinc and tin, and because these elements sit on specific sites in the crystal lattice, we have a different crystal type for, for CZTS known as kestorite, as opposed to the crystal structure for SIGs, which is known as chalcopyrite. And so when I'm talking about kestorites, I'm talking about a particular class of materials based on its crystal structure. So if we look at the development of kestorite solar cells, back in 1996, the first solar cells were demonstrated with efficiencies of around 0.7 percent. Uh, over the next 12 years, the efficiency was improved by about an order of magnitude to 6.8 percent. This was all done using vacuum-based approaches. When we started entering this field, we wanted to see if we could come up with solution-based approaches for doing this. The idea behind solution-based approaches is we don't need large vacuum chambers. We don't need high temperatures to evaporate, so costs should be reduced. Uh, and long story short, we were able to come up with a solution-based approach which uh, enabled us to also get to higher efficiency, about 40 percent higher than had previously been able to be achieved. Uh, and subsequently, we were able to get the power conversion efficiency up close to 13 percent. And basically, the solution-based process, I won't go through it in great detail, we're able to dissolve all the elements in hydrazine, which is a particular solvent. We can get a true solution from that, spread it out onto a substrate using spray coating, slit castings, uh, spin coating, 
And then we just take this precursor film and heat it up very quickly and we get the desired CZTS film. So we were very happy at getting to 12 percent. This was great progress, but as your question before, uh, where are we now? We're at 20 percent with SIGs and this is where we need to be with CZTS. And so if we look at where are we deficient in these particular CZTS devices, we can compare the current voltage curves for CZTS, that's the red curve, and we can look at what the theoretical limit is for a single junction solar cell, that's the black curve. And if you look at the horizontal axis, that's voltage, we could see that's one area where we're very deficient. That's the key area we need to improve. And we can ask the question, why are we deficient in this area for this particular uh, material? And I think uh, we can answer this by looking at the crystal structure. The orange atoms are copper, the blue atoms are zinc. Copper and zinc are very similar chemically and so they can very easily disorder onto each other's sites. When they disorder onto a, the, the opposite site, so you have anti-site disorder as it's called, you can introduce fluctuations in the electric field or in the potential in the material. So you're basically smearing out the band gap of that semiconductor and this reduces the effective size of that band gap and therefore the achievable open circuit voltage in the device. Uh, so this is our loss mechanism and so one project that we've started here at Duke and this is supported by the Energy Initiative and more recently by the National Science Foundation is to use what we learned from CZTS in terms of anti-site disorder and trying to come up with ways of designing new materials where A, we can controllably, we can tr control the disorder so we can study in these complex semiconductors how disorder impacts the properties that are important for PV, but more importantly we can hopefully also come up with semiconductors that have both earth abundance uh, and also high performance. And so this is one area we're working in. The other is, as I mentioned in perovskites, perovskite also refers to a crystal structure uh, and basically uh, the structure consists of a metal atom surrounded by six halogens in this case, uh, chlorine, bromine and I or iodine, and these octahedra of metal halogens connect at corners to create a three-dimensional structure. And uh, alternatively we can also make lower dimensional structures, two dimensional structures by taking an n layer thick cut from this three dimensional structure and stacking it up in alternation with organic cations. And so back in the 1990s we were studying these metal halide based perovskites which are mostly insulators and came up with a very interesting system wherein as we increase the thickness of the perovskite layers, these metal halide layers between the organic cations, uh, when we had a tin iodide metal halide framework, we not only could get semiconducting properties, but if we changed the thickness we could go to metallic type behavior. And so the exciting thing about this is that within this system we had a highly tunable semiconducting system that also, as it turns out, can be processed from near ambient temperatures common solvents like alcohols. So very cheaply processed. Uh, and this was exciting. We primarily looked at it for use in transistors coming from IBM. That was a natural choice and also for um, LEDs. Uh, more recently, very exciting developments have occurred incorporating these materials in solar cells. And the exciting point about it is that in only a few short years, the efficiency in these devices has gone from 3 percent up to greater than 20 percent. Um, in these devices. And so that's unprecedented performance in improvement in this class of materials. And again, these are very easy to process. Unfortunately, they do make use of lead. So the, the material is methyl ammonium lead iodide. So that's one problem with the technology moving forward. And uh, the stability is not great. So, you know, if they are heated too much, they decompose, etc. These are not good things for a solar cell. And likewise, um, depending how you get to a particular point in the current voltage curve, the, the operation point, the properties can be somewhat different. This is known as hysteresis, also a problem. And so 
We have another project here at, at Duke, which is sponsored by the, the DOE, where we're addressing this by trying to design new perovskite materials that A, don't have lead, and B, um, have larger formation energies, therefore more stability toward decomposition. So this is again a very strongly materials oriented project focus on designing new materials that hopefully can, can create some revolutionary materials. And so to conclude, I, I hope I've shown some of the ways in which I think new materials can, can truly revolutionize and, and help bring PV to play a prominent role within our energy mix. Um, thin film PV and also solution processing are, are, one, are two avenues to try and reduce cost of PV and, and get to a, an attractive cost, uh, cost point. Uh, I've also described how disorder, as we're going to more complex materials to try and access more tunability, uh, we also have issues with this more complex material in, in, ter in terms of disorder. So understanding that's important moving forward. And then finally, uh, I think, uh, that's why I'm standing here, I think photovoltaics uh, has a bright and, and important f uh, role to play in our future energy mix. Um, importantly, besides cost, uh, we also need to think, rethink the grid, coming up with a smart grid, uh, and also come up with solutions for uh, storage, because of course the sun doesn't always shine. Uh, and so, thank you. <laughs>